Over the last week and a half, we've gone over what an experimental design is. We've, we've covered what is a chemical change, what is a physical change, right? And we've said, we've, we've gone over what uh, an acid is, what is a base, what are the different types of chemical reactions, chemical reactions. We've looked at what is a molecule versus an atom. We looked at bonding, we've started to look at bonding. We've seen, when we looked at acid base, we've seen pH, and we've studied exactly what pH is, what is log, what is the negative log of, an, of a hydrogen ion concentration. We've looked at, we've looked at types, we've also looked at solutions and all the different parts of solutions. So we've covered a lot of material, and these are just the broad topics, there's a lot of detail in each of these. One of the things that is kind of overall uh, covers and is kind of interweaved with, uh, within all these different topics is this idea of experimental design. And experimental design is incredibly important uh, because it is what science is. Without, ex without having an experiment, a good experimental design, you don't have science. What you have is, is magic. And magic isn't what we really want to focus in on in this class. And what exactly is a, ba a science, what is science knowledge, and how do we gather it? How do we know what we know, and how might it change over time? Those are the things that I hope you get out of the idea of studying what an experimental design is. You were to design your experiment, and you were to come up with a control group and an experimental group, and you're supposed to do it next week, uh, this coming Monday or Wednesday, depending on which group you are in. If you're second block, you'll be doing your experiments uh, during second block uh, on Monday. And if you're fourth or fifth block, you'll be doing your presentations on Monday and your experiments on Wednesday. Okay. As the different experimental designs were presented, there were a lot of great ideas. Some ideas were, were good, they just lacked follow through. And, there, and as often happens things get really complicated once you start working your way through um, your ideas and sometimes the specifics get foggy if you get if things get too complicated I'm going to use one one really good example that uh, some one of the groups came up with um, that took a tangent from where we were trying to go um, they took the idea of a chemical reactivity in acid and base and they didn't ask the question that, that a lot of people were asking uh, that, that really was the question that was posed to you, which is if we have a clear liquid and we mix it with another clear liquid and we produce a third clear liquid, how do we know a chemical reaction has occurred? What this group decided to do is, is try to go with this idea of a penny and say, does a penny, and they did some research and they found out that acids tend to clean pennies better than bases and they wanted to test this. Um, so they, they came up with this idea of dirty, and they said, well, the first problem I pointed out to them is that the first question is, what do you consider dirty? Because some people consider dirty if it's something's oxidized, you know, or what, some, what we call tarnish. And what that means is that the copper of the, on the outside of the penny uh, combines with oxygen in a chemical reaction to form a green ox uh, copper oxide. The other issue is that the, that dirt might act, the stuff on the outside of the penny might actually be dirt. It might be grease, it might be minerals, it might be various chemicals on it. And so when you're trying to, we call these, if you're looking and trying to look at this chemical reaction here of, of oxidation, then these, this dirt would be a confounding factor. You'd be difficult to isolate this chemical reaction and really talk about did this occur or not and how can we reverse it, which I'm, I'm assuming that's where they were going with their penny experiment. 
it would be confounded by the idea of is the dirt this reaction, this tarnishing, this oxidation, or is the dirt actual dirt, grease, and minerals, and various chemicals that found in the environment. So this was not uh, as good an idea as it, as, as it first looked like on paper, and we worked through it, and we decided to go ahead and focus on some of the other great ideas. And again, it was good. It was a good idea. It just didn't, wasn't going to work out well, especially with the time that we have to work with. So we st went back to the original concept of here we have this acid that's clear, uh, water, hydrochloric acid in solution with water. Uh, then here we have sodium hydroxide in solution with water. And we call this A, and this is B. And we're mixing them together, and we're forming something else, this new liquid over here. The volume is doubled, right? So this is, this is 5 milliliters, and this is 5 milliliters, and we have 10 milliliters of uh, product over here. The question is, did a chemical reaction happen? Well, in theory, a neutralization reaction happened. The, sodium, the hydrochloric acid reacted with the sodium hydroxide, and it produced water and salt. But we have no evidence of this by just looking at it. We can't see anything happen. We can't taste it because it's dangerous. We can't smell it. So there's no smell to it, really. No difference in smell between the three of them. We can't really feel it because nobody wants to put their fingers in it. And it's not safe and it's like breaking our safety rules. And it's not, of course, we can't really, so touch and feel the same thing. So, so we can't really do any of that, just obvious observation. So we have to do something else. We have to come up with an experiment that could prove that this is different from A and B. At the very least, to begin the study of whether this is actually water and salt, at the very least, we have to just say, is the product different from NaOH and HCl? That's really the question, right? Because if it's different, then something's changed, essentially. So this is, this is chemically changed if it's not, if it doesn't, if it's essentially different from either A or B. So there were three methods that you guys came up with, the second block students came up with it without my help, which I thought was phenomenal. The first, the first group thought, well, we know that water vaporizes 100 degrees in in Cleveland, and NaCl is about, uh, vaporizes at about 1,000 degrees. They knew that. They knew that water evaporated. They knew that the water could evaporate and the salt would be left over. So if we have, if theoretically there's salt water here, then if we evaporate the water, we should be left with salt. There should be more salt here than there is, let's say, in tap water. Uh, and certainly if you evaporate Na HCl and AOH, you're not going to have that, that as much NaCl. You won't have salt crystals left over. So therefore, if salt water is the product, then when I boil off the water, I should have more salt than if I boiled off tap water. I want to point out this if, this if-then statement. What I like about this if-then statement is that it's actually something that's measurable. Some of, the, some of you have put down, if, if uh, I mix hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide, then I will get water and, a, and, a, and sodium chloride, which is fine. It is a hypothesis. Uh, the issue is it's not as clearly testable, right? It doesn't really speak to where, what am I going to do to answer the question, did this actually occur? So if I'm, you know, what... What this particular hypothesis does actually answer the question. I had something that's measurable. I'm going to be able to measure the mass of the sodium, the sodium chloride in the beaker. I'll be able to measure all, th all the beakers. I'll be able to measure the mass of the beaker. And by doing so, I'll, be able, I'll know well, how much salt I have. I know my control group from this hypothesis. I can tell my control group is going to be boiling tap water. Another control that would be the negative control group. Let me here. Let me break it down in the next in in the next slide. Then, so if we take this this hypothesis and we think about what would, would what would we need to actually make this into an experiment? Well, the first thing we'd need is some kind of experimental group. All right. And the next thing you'd need is some kind of control group. Remember, the control group is the thing you're going to be comparing your experimental results to, to set, that's going to answer your question, is this something different or not? 
So here we have salt water and then we have boiling tap water. Well, our experimental group uh, is going to be, uh, remember, uh, let's look first what we're going to do. We're going to take A and we're going we're gonna to add it to B. And we're gonna it's gonna yield some product C. Okay, it's gonna be double the volume, and we think we think C is this new stuff. Okay, so you think this new stuff is NaCl. That's table salt, and we think it's and that's we think it's in solution with water. That's what we think. Okay. So when we're looking at the experimental group. Well, we're, what are we gonna do? We're gonna take this C. And we're gonna and we're gonna boil it on a, on a flame, and it, and after some time, the water is gonna evaporate into steam. So the water is gonna leave, the solvent is gonna leave, and what's gonna be left over is a solute. Because remember, a solution is a physical change. We can separate them easily by boiling off the water. So, oops, I shouldn't have drawn in water, a liquid. There's no liquid left. So we should be left with a coating of, of salt on the inside of the, of the beaker. And um, where you had a clear liquid, now you're going to have this, this kind of layer of salt all on the glass. And there's no liquid left. We're going we're gonna to put that on a balance. Now, in the, the, it'll be an electronic balance. We'll measure its mass. We'll measure the mass before with an empty beaker, and then the mass with the beaker, so the mass of the beaker, and then the mass of the beaker. So this is one. Um, let's change the color of the pen here. So this is one, beaker one, the empty beaker, and then this is empty uh, the beaker two. So we need two beakers. We're going to be one uh, that... That's, that beaker was the one that was C was in. That's this number two. And then uh, we'll need the, we would have measured the beaker well, while it was empty. And then we have it now while well, it's full. And then you take two and you subtract one from it. Their masses, the grams of the mass of two and the mass of one. And what you'll get is the mass of the salt. And you'll do that for every group. So if you subtract the mass of the beaker with the salt after the experiment, after you boiled off the water from the mass, if you subtract the mass of the empty beaker, you're going to get the mass of the salt. That should be clear to you. Now, in the control group, though, we need something to compare it to. How does, what is that? that by itself won't tell us anything. All we'll know if we take a look at the salt in underneath the microscope, we'll be able to see tiny little cubes of it. We'll see little cubes, and you can even see it with your bare eyes that you'll see little cubes of salt. So that's fine, but that doesn't tell us much because we, we still don't have anything to compare it to. So what we would do is we would have a negative and a positive control. We'd have the negative control, which is what would happen if there was no salt in it? Well, how would we do that? Well, we boil off tap water. We do the same thing. We'd have a one full of uh, an empty beaker, and we'd measure the mass of the empty beaker. Then we would take the mass of the beaker after the water has been evaporated, and we'd have just a tiny little bit of salt in it. There's salt in fresh water. It's just not a lot. There might be a, a difference in the mass. There might be a difference in the mass. It may be perceptible, so we have to take into consideration that we have this, you know, this beaker that has this little bit of mass in it, and this is what we want to know. This is the number that we want. We want to subtract two from one, and after we subtract two from one, we will have then our negative balance and ideally if this is true if this reaction is producing salt then this mass this number two this mass of salt is going to actually be a great deal larger than the mass of salt here in the negative control right 
because the negative control should have a lot less mass because it's fresh water. Then we'll have a positive control, and the positive control is going to be salt water. And when you have the salt water, you're going to do exactly the same thing. You're going to have this time. You're going to have again. You're going to have your, you're going to measure the beaker without before you add the salt water. That'll be your one, your measurement one, and then you'll have your the leftover after you after you boil off the salt water the water from the salt water. You'll have the mass. of your second beaker. Subtract two from one and you're going to get the mass of the salt here. Now since this is your positive controls, it's either going to have what you'd expect to see is you'd expect to see the, ma the salt mass to be equal to or greater than the mass of your experimental group. Because here you know, you know that there is salt. You know, oh no, you know there is salt. Right. So something like this would be a really great control group. Here you have. Let's let's go down the list and see if we have if we have everything that we're supposed to have. We have our hypothesis. There it is. We have our our expected results and our theory. We have our experimental group. We have our procedure and we can list out the steps. We have to think about the steps and make sure we're doing them correctly. We have our, the things we're comparing, the mass of the salt of the experimental group to the mass of the salt of our negative control and the mass of the salt for our positive control. Positive meaning that, that we know there's going to be salt and negative meaning we know there's not going to be salt, or at least as much. So in the negative control we expect little to no salt and in the Positive control, we expect to have be uh, as much, if not more, salt. So, you know, that's a decent experiment. And if, and if we see that indeed those are the results, then we know that something's happened here. Something's happened here, and we can check that off. And we can make an argument that this is something that's new. Are we 100% sure that this particular chemical reaction occurred? We'd have to do further investigations. And when do we know? that something has occurred, at what point do we say, okay, we're sure that this is the, what's going on? After a lot of experimentation, after a lot of different people have looked at, have looked at the same reaction in different ways. And of course, this particular reaction has been looked at hundreds and thousands of different ways, and we're sure that this is what's happening. But the, what's cool is that you guys came up with three ways of figuring, that, figuring out or coming up with evidence that suggest that suggest strongly uh, what's going on here, without the help of anyone else. You did. I'm really, really proud of these guys that came up with all these different ways of discovering what's going on in this chemical reaction. This group decided to take a, a different look at um, a chemical reaction, and what they said is if. You test the chemical reaction of hydrochloric acid, which is a known, and an NaOH, which is a known, with various compounds, and our product is neither, uh, is neither, then the product should react differently with a re that same compound. So what do they mean by that? Well, let's think about this. If this were hydrochloric acid here in this column, so, and this were NaOH in this column. So this is what's going on, and this is what's going on when you mix it with, I, I'm making these up, but let's say zinc, and let's say this is in this, in this row, and in this row, this is what happens when you mix it with, with uh, silver chloride. Now, you have to understand that you guys already did these results and you have them. Uh, you know what the actual results are, but let's assume that this is this particular uh, situation, this result is what you get when you mix hydrochloric acid and zinc. And this is that when you mix sodium hydroxide and zinc, this is what you get. And when so, uh, uh, silver chloride and hydrochloric acid, you get this. And silver chloride and sodium hydroxide, you get that. So the, for the sake of argument, let's take a look and say that this 
that these these results are the ones that we're that we're most concerned with and that these are accurate they're not we know they're not you've seen the actual results of mixing these chemicals together you have a table that you've created but when you're looking at these different uh, these markers these these results for this argument let's take a look at these and, and, and see if we can understand this process their hypothesis and how they might actually test it so their ideas again they're going to start with the same thing that we that everyone else starts with which is hey we're taking this this HCl this hydrochloric acid and we're mixing it with uh, this sodium hydroxide and our question is did this produce something new and if so is it sodium is it sodium chloride and water that's really our 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 question here did it make something new did something else did a chemical reaction occur well their hypothesis then says well if if hydrochloric acid when it mixes with zinc makes this and sodium hydroxide when it mixes with zinc makes that and when hydrochloric acid mixes with sodium uh, silver chloride, it makes this. And when sodium hydroxide mixes with sodium chloride, it makes this. Then, if this is neither hydrochloric acid nor sodium hydroxide, then when I mix it with zinc or with silver chloride, I shouldn't get any of these. I should get something different. I should get something different. So what they would do in their exterm in their ex and what they would do is of course they would take hydrochloric acid and they'd mix it with, with zinc and they'd see they'd get this and they'd take hydrochloric acid and mix it with silver uh, silver chloride and they'd and uh, they'd ma they'd make this and uh, uh, and they'd take sodium hydroxide and 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 mix and mix it with uh, silver chloride and they'd make this you know whatever and. That would be their control groups. These would be their control groups. These would be their positive controls. So these are your positive. These are the things that you know actually react. And this is what you're going to use to compare your, your unknown to. This is your unknown. Now we need a negative control. We have to, say, you have to ask the, yourself the question, well, what if nothing happens? What does nothing happens looks like? Well, you would say maybe this row is what happens. Maybe this is what happens when nothing happens. Maybe this is water, just plain water. So here's your negative control. So you have your negative control here. That's your water mixing in with your zinc and your silver chloride and you have your positive control two of them that's one for hydrochloric acid and the other one for sodium hydroxide so you have that you know those those are your controls now your experimental control is you're gonna mix your unknown your question you're gonna take your unknown and you're gonna put it in with the zinc and the hydrochloric acid and the and the uh, and the silver chloride, and you're going to see what you get. And maybe you get this. Maybe you get something completely different than what you'd ex than what you had. Maybe this is what you get when you mix the unknown with with uh, silver chloride, and maybe this is what you get when you mix the unknown with zinc. So if you're mixing this, uh, so now you compare the, all these together and you can see that not these two, one and two, are completely different from all the other uh, products that, all the other reactions, all your controls. They look nothing like any of the controls. So these, this reactivity, the reactivity, and what you would say is that the reactivity, how the chemical, how this unknown liquid reacts with some compound the reactivity is different if the chemical reactivity is different from what it started with then we know that a chemical change has occurred and if a chemical change has occurred we've, we've taken a step towards understanding that there that something actually happened is it an acid base is it neutral is it salt 
We don't know from this experiment. We can't tell from this experiment. But we can tell from this experiment that something happened or not. So this is a really great, really great uh, strategy and something that really I didn't expect a ninth grader to come up with. So it was really, really a great idea. Good job to this group. Okay, here, this, this group, actually several groups tried to do this, and I think it was a, an excellent idea, is they tried to use some kind of pH indicator. Now here, you'll see that this is phenolphthalein, and phenolphthalein in alkaline solution changes this color. Uh, when phenolphthalein is in distilled water, uh, you have this color here, and it's, it was slightly acidic, you'll have... Uh, uh, you'll have a little bit of uh, uh, clear, it'll look clear, and according to an alkaline solution, it looks like so. Phenopathelene is really great for titrations, and what that means is you, you, when, you're, when you're dropping one drop at a time, you want to find out the concentration of one unknown in using, the, using a known concentration, because remember, when, you, when you're dealing with an acid-base reaction, it's called a neutralization reaction, so... If you take this alkaline or base solution and you add it to an acid, it should make a, a, neutral, a neutral solution so it'll look clear. So the minute that this pink goes to clear, or vice versa, depending on what you're titrating, then you've known you've reached the equilibrium points, so you've known you've reached neutralization, you know the concentrations are the same. That's not really important, but I thought you might want to know that. Not really important for what we're doing right now. Uh, when you're in chemistry and you're doing and you're actually doing titrations, then it becomes fairly important, obviously. And it's a very important biological concept because when you're you know, doing uh, experiments, sometimes you have to do titrations to find out what an unknown concentration is of an acid or a base. Now, when you're dealing with uh, this particular experiment, with you want to know again, starting again, you have this unknown uh, a. Uh, you have an acid, rather, uh, hydrochloric acid here, and you're adding it to a known base. I said unknown, but I meant known. Uh, and that known base is NaOH. And you want to know, did that react and produce a third... Uh, uh, did that react and produce water and salt? Well, what's cool about producing water and salt is that in, if the acid would have phenolphthalein in one color, and the base will have, I mean, I'm sorry, acid is over here. Acid would have one color, and a base another color. It's not very, it's not as useful as something that we call um, pH paper, or pH hydron paper, because pH paper actually gives you a myriad of colors a scale, whole scale that lets you go from 1 all the way around to 11 and there's different pH papers for different pHs and some of them are actually uh, some of them can actually measure you know 0.5's and you can actually measure uh, in between the, the 1 and the 2 and we even have probes, electron probes that, uh, that you can use a calculator with that will actually measure the exact pH of all the liquids that you, st that you stick a probe into. So what's interesting is that if we do have this, this is something we have, it's easily available, and what the, th the, 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 the you can read the hypothesis here is if you test the hydrochloric acid, it should change the, the pH paper one color, and that, should, there, that color, would, you know, if this is hydrochloric acid, it's a zero, it should be about red. So there should be a red color here. Let me go ahead and make that change. So this pH paper should be red because it's in hydrochloric acid. If I have, if I stick that pH paper in a base, it should be closer to a dark blue. Let's see if I can get a dark blue on this scale. It should be a dark blue. And if I get neutral, if I get neutral, which would be here, I should get something around a green. So, knowing that we should have 
this pH paper when we stick it into the HCl, I mean the uh, the unknown, it should come out some shade of green, actually a darker shade of green. It's more more I can't get can't seem to get the color right here. But in any case, maybe this will work. I'm not sure. Yeah, that's better. So it gets a, a nice hunt, and it will turn the pH paper a darker green. And knowing that that green, now we can compare those, can't we? Now we can say, well, now we can say, well, the, the fact is that the unknown was one color, color one, and the, the HCL was a color two, and NaOH was a color three. So now we know those, this, of course, these would be our control groups. These would be our positive controls. And our negative controls then would be something like water. So we'd know what water was. Uh, so there'd be a four, which would be a green. So we'd expect in our hypothesis that we would expect that actually this unknown, this questionable one, whether there was a reaction or not, that this color would match the color of about seven, which would be the color of the water the pH paper when it's put in water. And it's just that simple experiment, a good table, and a quick set of, uh, of measurements will get you your answer. So those are the three really good strategies that people came up with, and the different control groups that people should be able to write up, and the data that people should be able to collect to come up with a conclusion on whether something actually was reacted and whether that reaction was water and, so and sodium chloride. All right, thanks. I hope this was good for you. All right, bye-bye.